The Georgia Tech game is done and gone and over. The team has turned the corner and it's time for all of us to do the same as we prepare for the first Carolina Duke matchup of the season. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, February 2nd, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shea, joined by our good friend, Coach Pat Kilby, and we are here on a Friday getting you ready for Carolina hosting Duke. Big thanks to you everydayers for joining us to get your Carolina content every day. If you're new to the show, we'd love to have you come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community. Come for the heels, stay for the cord. It's awesome. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. You want to be a part of that as we get ready for Duke. It's going to be a great weekend. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Pack, it is a loaded weekend of content on the Locked on Tar Heels channel. Not only do we have this show going up, I recorded a crossover episode with JJ Jackson, the host of Locked on Blue Devils. I'm going to link that right up in the corner so you can see it. Dropping tomorrow on Saturday morning is a conversation that Brendan Marks and I have. Brendan is a writer for college basketball for The Athletic, but for a long time covered both Carolina and Duke. So this man is really inside of everything. Make sure you check that out. And then, best of all, after the game tomorrow night, live postcast. We're going to be getting after it, breaking it down, win or lose. So don't miss out on that. Pack, let's get into talking about this thing. First off, I want to get us turning the corner um, away from the Georgia Tech game because there, there's a couple comments we got, both from Joel Berry, and when I say we, I don't mean like we unlocked on Tar Heels, I mean like we, the public, got from Joel Berry and Coach Davis. Joel said this, even the best have off days. Carolina had won 10 games in a row and played remarkably well during that stretch, but it's natural to have tired legs and be mentally and physically exhausted. We don't trip over losing one day, do we? And then Coach Davis, I mean, Pac, I was all in with this comment from Coach. I'd love to hear your response to it. Coach Davis said, you can whine and complain, you can point fingers, and you can make excuses, or you can get back up and move forward. To me, there's no, there's not really a choice. Coach Pat Kilby, you hear that from one of the greatest point guards in Carolina history. You hear it from the head coach of the Tar Heels as you finish that Georgia Tech game and look to the Duke game. What do you think about those comments? Well, I think I think Joel's comment was really good. You know, I agree with Joel's coach's comment, man, that's money. And if that doesn't make you want to run through a wall for that man. I, that's you know, exactly what I said on Twitter. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that just fired me up. But but it's also like just can we just take a minute and, and take a step back? That's not basketball. That's just life. Yes. Good you know, call. I mean, and that's what this is about, you know, and coach is so good at that. Like sometimes you just, you, you can't point fingers. You can, you can't whine. You can't complain. You just got to get up and keep going. And I, I, I can't echo that sentiment enough from coach Davis. He, he nailed it on the head. Yeah, man. I'll look, go to war with that coach any day of the week. I, If for people who are always like, oh, Hubert Davis is too nice and too kind, I don't know what coach you're watching on the sideline, but this man is feisty and fiery, and I love it. Now, Peck, something else that happened after the Georgia Tech game that I think helps move us now into this Duke conversation um, at, at the team's kind of media availability on Thursday. A lot of folks obviously dropping content on that uh, from that on Twitter. And one of the things that Tar Heel Illustrated put, this is uh, mostly typically comes from Andrew Jones, their publisher, said, Armando Baycott said the players organically met in the locker room after returning from Georgia Tech on Tuesday night and spent about an hour and 45 minutes discussing the loss, how they played, and getting their minds right for Duke. The coaches were not in there with them, the meeting started well after midnight. So, Pat Kilby, you are a basketball coach. Do you typically find that these kind of players-only meetings are more helpful or more hurtful to what comes next? 
Well, I think, you know, they can be a little bit of both. But to me, um, the key word here and in, in what Armando said was organically. Bingo. And that, that really stood out to me. That means it wasn't forced. It wasn't pressed. It wasn't, man, we took one loss. Now there's chemistry issues or we're down in the dumps or uh, we're trying to just, you know, get our wits about us and figure out how to respond. This wasn't that. This was the team coming together getting back in sync, picking each other up. Yeah. Um, there were some guys on this team that, like Harrison Ingram, for instance, this is his first time to experience an ACC loss. And I know that um, he's experienced that before. I mean, he's an experienced player, but just cool. coming together, regrouping, you know, yeah. gathering the troops in a sense. And so um, – Meanwhile, Cormac Ryan and Jalen Withers have experienced a whole truck ton of ACC losses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, but, and, and, and so, you know, to me, I, I see this as a really good thing. And I see this as them sinking back up. And, you know, when you look at the Georgia Tech game, there's a lot of things you can point to, but sure. it really felt like we just weren't in sync, you know, especially offensively. It just, the flow wasn't there. It, was, it wasn't there. And um, this probably was one of those meetings of chemistry and gelling, getting back together. Hey, we, we screwed this one up but we know we got to bounce back and we got a great opportunity to do it on Saturday. So I love to see that from our guys and it makes me feel good about the direction we're headed. I'm right with you, Pac. It, it's the kind of thing for me where not all players only meetings are created equal. The context of this meeting is so integral. I love that you said the key word is organic 100%. So often when you have these players only meetings, it comes after a long stretch of, crappiness or suckitude or whatever bad word, you know, like we've not been playing well, something is clearly amiss and we got to fix it. This one to me is just about like, Hey, we're a really good experienced basketball team. So let's just talk about what happened, figure it out so that it doesn't happen again. It's that low. That's how much this team expects of themselves and of each other. That is, uh, accountability in a big way that the team did not have last year. And, and it's not just one person calling it out, man. This is a group of men coming together to say, we're going to hold each other to a higher standard here. Oh, and by the way, let's go ahead and talk about, as you said, how to help you guys process your first ever Duke game. Because look, remember folks, there were only four returning scholarship players on this team. Armando Baycott, RJ Davis, Jalen Washington, and Seth Trimble. And then obviously, you know, you, you've you got the walk-on guys as well. But outside of that, everyone, both freshmen and all the transfers are brand new to this thing in terms of playing in it. And so it's going to be a different ballgame. So, Pac, how do we go about doing this? Because um, one of the things that it's critical for RJ and Armando in particular to do is help the players keep this game in its proper context. You and I and fans and everybody else we can make a mountain out of this thing and go crazy and vitriol and all of that. But for the players and coaches, it is critically important to not make this game better than bigger, excuse me, than it is. Yes, you got to have your mind right because it's an environment unlike any other, but it's still just a basketball game and it's still just one ACC game that matters one ACC game's worth in the standings. Yeah. And, you know, you've really got to keep things in perspective. So, the timing of this is perfect because our team at Carl Albert, we're playing our rival tonight. And so we've been having this kind of the same conversation with our guys. And here's, here's the thing that we're really preaching. And I, I suspect this is probably what Carolina is talking about as well is at the end of the day, this is basketball hmm. and college game day is going to be in town and it's Carolina Duke and the stands are going to be packed and it's going to be rowdy. And all that stuff is cool. It's awesome. It makes for a great environment. But at the end of the day, you've got one thing you've got to focus on, and it's basketball. And you've got to know your job. You've got to know your role. And you've got to be ready to perform that at a high level. That's it. Tune everything else out. Tune it out. Be ready to go. And so I think that's what these guys have to focus on. Um, just, just being locked in, ready to play and do their job. And at the end of the day, if we play a better brand of basketball and that's what we're bought into and that's what we're locked in on and we're focused on, then we're going to win the game. 
Pack, regardless of what happens on the court, Carolina is a better brand of basketball than Duke. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, no, man, no. I know we're all on board with that. Everyone is either listening to or watching this and nodding along because they, they all know it's true, unless there's Duke fans hate listening and watching, in which case you're welcome, and we're glad you're here. Um, Pack, one of the things that's true as we move from the big picture of it into talking about the game itself is that matchups – always play a critical role in every Carolina Duke game. Who guards who and what does it look like? Who's the unsung heroes? All of those kind of things. So we're going to dive into those matchups in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl lead up to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like Coach Pack and me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about finding that comfiest chair on the couch uh, getting yourself some good food, good drinks, checking out the prop bet, seeing what kind of ridiculous, you know, like how long the national anthem is going to be. I love all those. So you can get into that with FanDuel. They've got so many ways for you to end the season with a W. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, the 49ers are favored right now by a point and a half, by the way, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score, will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. So new customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, Isaac Shade, Coach Pat Kilby, joining you on Friday to get you ready for Carolina Duke round one. Pack, one of the things that always is key, key, key integral to all of these games is how the teams match up against each other. Uh, oftentimes, it's very different looking personnel, and that leads to some weird matchups on both ends of the court. Now, Duke has dealt with some injury issues throughout this season, so they've rolled out six different lineups this year. None of them used more than eight times. Um, interestingly, uh, recently or the last two games at least the starting five has been Tyrese Proctor, Jared McCain, Mark Mitchell, Kyle Filipowski and Caleb Foster. I expect coach Pack that tomorrow night when we see the starting lineups come out because this is Duke and Carolina it's going to flip back to what they had been doing earlier this season. Caleb Foster will be back on the bench and you'll get that Jeremy Roach Tyrese Proctor backcourt, Jared McCain at the 3, Mark Mitchell at the 4 and Kyle Filipowski at the 5. I, look, I know people have been asking. I feel like we've been seeing questions lately about should we see Seth Trimble in the starting lineup? It, it, those kind of things. The answer is no. The starting lineup for Carolina will not and should not, frankly, change. It will be Elliot Cadeau, RJ Davis, Cormac Ryan, Harrison Ingram, and Armando Baycott. So, Pac, let's look at those starting matchups. Um, Tyrese Proctor is typically running the point with Jeremy Roach at the two. So, we expect to see Elliot Cadeau against Proctor. R.J. Davis against Jeremy Roach, Cormac Ryan against Jared McCain, their best three-point shooter, although Tyrese Proctor has been hot from deep lately. Harrison Ingram against Mark Mitchell. That is a very intriguing matchup. And Pack, I think the most intriguing matchup out of all of this for me, I know you're looking at the backcourt. For me, I'm really curious to see what happens with Armando Baycott and Kyle Filipowski. Yeah, that is, you're right. That's a very intriguing matchup. Um, you know, Flip is so, <clears throat> so wiry and so um, just, you know, just around the rim. He's hard to, to stay in front of him. He's hard to guard. And um, that, that matchup is very intriguing to me. Uh, the matchup that I'm extremely intrigued by is, like you mentioned, the backcourt in general, but just really breaking down Cadeau versus Proctor, RJ versus Roach. Um, you know, Cadeau and Proctor, that intrigues me. I think. Elliot's speed is just going to be really effective there. You know, oh, that's a good word, Pac. That's really good. I think I think that can disrupt. And and you know, like you mentioned, Proctor's been shooting the ball well lately, but it's it's hard to do that if somebody's up in your chili the whole time. And and Cadeau's got the foot speed to be able to do that. And so I think we can disrupt there. And then RJ, man, he he owes Jeremy one. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. That dude, uh, you know, actually, we owe them two. We need to go two and zero this year, and we need to start with with this one. Yeah. But you know, I think, I think 
you know, RJ is – he's got something to prove in this game, maybe more so than than anybody else on our team. And so that's what makes me so intrigued by the guard matchups. Why do you say that, Pac? Why do, why do you say that RJ has more to prove? You know, I just felt like maybe it's a gut instinct thing. I don't have any one thing I'm really hanging my hat on. It's just, yeah. you know, that the Jeremy Roach last year, I thought he kind of got a little lippy, a little mouthy. And, and Carolina didn't play well last year. I mean, obviously, 0-2 and, and, and it wasn't our year. This is a new year, and this is RJ's team, and this is Duke coming to town. And what stands, you know, to, to be gained or to lose in this game is to have sole possession of the ACC and a two-game lead on Duke or be tied with Duke for first place. There's, just, there's a lot to prove there. And, and specifically tied in the loss column. We would still be one game ahead in the win column, but it's really the losses we're looking at. So ultimately, yes, tied. Right. And and so I just – I think with this being RJ's team, I think he just feels like he's got a lot to prove. Um, and, and I think he's going to prove that. I mean, the way he's been playing, what he's done for us this year is just remarkable, and, and I expect that to continue. Peck, let me ask you something else about the backcourt because it's kind of similar to uh, Wake Forest and Hunter Salas, who's 6'5". Tyrese Proctor's a big dude, 6'5". How does Elliot does does Elliot Cadeau's speed offset that in some ways? Yeah, I think so. I, I really think it does. And um, obviously, you know, I'll be curious to see how Duke um, attacks that. You know, if he uh, tries to get to the lane more, if they post him up some, just to see if he can take advantage of, of Elliot Cadeau and that size mismatch. No, getting. But getting as we all know, I mean. Cadeau, it's not easy to post him up. That is pretty man. stout down there. Yeah. And and so I think he can hold his own. His speed is definitely going to be a difference maker. Now, Pac, what's interesting is while Duke has the size advantage there, Jared McCain, their best shooter, who's the sm uh, small forward, is 6'3". Cormac Ryan is going to have a size advantage against him. And while we've been looking at the bookends, the backcourt and the front court, man, this wing matchup could be critical. Jared McCain is a dude. If you've not seen him shoot the basketball, it is a beautiful thing. You talked about getting up into Chile a little bit. Can my man Cormac Ryan mess this dude up and get him off his game? Absolutely he can. Um, I mean, Cormac's got – he he's got the experience, you know, and where I think that really pays off is he's able to watch film and really narrow in on what – McCain's tendencies are yeah. where are his spots where does he like to get the ball where does he like to shoot it where can I you know make him uncomfortable um can I make him you know catch it going to the left more than you know the right because he doesn't feel as comfortable doing that you know just the little nuances of the game I think Cormac is going to be able to pick up on those things and when McCain has the ball Cormac is super good at, at on ball defense and I think that's maybe the most underrated thing that he does and so I think we'll see that come into play. Yeah. I mean, this is a 25-year-old against a college freshman. Critical yep. matchup. Um, Pac, we already kind of touched on, um, you know, uh, Baycott and Filipowski a little bit. I think there's some push and shove both ways, some pros and cons for both teams. Um, actually, we unpacked that a little bit more when J.J. Jackson and I did our crossover. And then um, Brendan Marks and I will talk about that a little bit more as well. So that said, let's actually switch to talking about the bench a little bit because interestingly both of these teams regardless of duke's injuries are going about eight deep we know for carolina outside of the starters it's really seth trimble and the jalen's getting the majority of the minutes with a little sprinkling of pax and wojic and zayden high here and there for duke um you know assuming health and assuming they do make this starting lineup change we're expecting the guy the three guys chiefly coming off the bench to get the minutes are sean stewart and caleb foster two more freshmen and Ryan Young, uh, another transfer, um, he uh, coming from Northwestern, just like um, uh, Pete Nance did as well. So, Pac, do you have thoughts on advantage one way coming off the bench? Yeah, I think it's clear advantage, Carolina. And, Why so? Interesting. Uh, you know, I just think, uh, I think consistency. You know, I think Duke's bench has had some games. Uh, but their lineup changes and their injuries, there hasn't been you know clear flow for them. And so because of that, I think there's been some inconsistency. And 
you know, going into the year, we were going, are we going to have a consistent bench? Are we going to have a bench at all? And it's turned in, in my opinion, to being a big time strong suit for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you just look at what Seth can do coming off the bench. Uh, He can come in and if McCain gets hot, we can go, okay, okay, Seth. Because they're go. they're similarly sized, man. That's a good word. Yeah, and and you know, I think a lot of times we look at it and we go, "Well, is Carolina's bench going to get 15 points, and Duke's only going to get 10, or we going to outscore them?" And I mean, yes, that's important. I'm not saying it's not, but what these guys can bring us off the bench defensively is going to be big time. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I just really like what our bench is able to do. I think we're more uh, versatile, more consistent, and I think that's going to be a big time factor. Okay. So, Pac, let's get even deeper into the weeds on this game. We're going to go to our four corners preview where we need to talk a little bit about Carolina's defense, which is still crazy highly rated at Ken Palm. But there's been a little bit of some crack showing lately in points per possession. We'll tell you more about that in just a second. All right, before we get into our four corners, let me quickly set the stage for us. The biggest rivalry, the best rivalry in all of sports, Carolina versus Duke, Saturday, February 3rd, 6.30 Eastern time tip-off on ESPN. Uh, Kim Palm line, UNC is favored by six. There is not currently a fan duel line available yet. Um, some some recruits are going to be visiting. Uh, juniors, class of 2025. Caleb Wilson, Caleb Wilson and Jasper Johnson will be visiting. So uh, need to make a good impression on those two. Isaac, why don't you uh, start us off with our first four corner? Yes, let's get into it. Four corners preview point number one. Pack defense and communication. This is a two-headed guy, and I'll tell you why. Pack, we've been watching a lot this year. You and I have the points per possession. Carolina's been doing great. The the threshold for points per possession, as you've so well talked about, is kind of one point per possession. That's your average. That's your goal. You offensively want to be above it. You defensively want to keep your opponent under it. Carolina has only been under it offensively twice this year. Great stuff. Unfortunately, it was Georgia Tech, and I think the game at NC State was the other. But, Pack, while Carolina and their defensive adjustments have allowed them to keep a majority of their opponents under one point per possession lately, four of the last five opponents have sneakily gotten up over one against the Tar Heels. Now, Pac, one of the things we need to know about this game is of the two, uh, Carolina's defense rates more highly in efficiency. Defense is fourth right now at Ken Palm. Offense is 19th. For Duke, it is their offense that rates more highly. I believe they are ninth, and their defense is in the 30s or 40s. So, Pack, four corners preview point number one, how can Carolina's defense can kind of get back to holding these Duke Blue Devils down under a point per possession? Well, the big thing that, that Carolina's defense has been talked about for is their three-point line defense. And that is the key. That's a major key because when you think about – three-point attempts, three-point makes, and how that's going to affect a point per possession, you know, that that's a big deal. And so uh, we've just got to be really good from the three-point line. And and with that, we've got to finish defensive possessions with rebounds. We can't yeah. give second chances. We can't give them uh, the most efficient shot in basketball, which is free throws. And so we've got to do a really, really good job of, of – forcing contested tough shots from the perimeter and not giving second chances up. And I think if they do that, they're going to set themselves up to to get back to that high-quality defense that we've been playing so far this season. And, Pac, part of the defense for me as well is communication, which was a main issue on defense last year where Carolina was failing to call out switches and talk on the floor. Um, And notably, interestingly, from the first Duke game of the season, Carolina had a shot to win this thing late at Cameron – And there was a play where I forget what happened. Carolina didn't communicate well. Jeremy Roach basically got a wide open layup as a result and talked about it. You talked about him getting lippy. He talked Mm -hmm. about it after the game saying, basically, I knew Carolina was going to mess that up because they hadn't been talking all game. Pack, what a difference a year makes where now I'm not frankly concerned about that at all because Carolina is bought in on the defensive end. They know what they're doing with these switches 
and it is so seamless. Sometimes if your eye isn't watching, you don't even catch the switch because they pass off so well in that way. So really looking for that tomorrow. Let's just put the muzzle on Jeremy Roach in a big way. Shut that man down. Now, Emily Von Pocky, our friend on the Discord, asked, what was Carolina's points per possession, since we were just talking about that, in the Georgia Tech game compared to the prior conference games? What points per possession should Carolina strive for in the upcoming games, and especially as they move into the tournament play in March? So, Emily, against Georgia Tech, Carolina allowed them 1.028 points per possession. As we just said, four of the prior, including Georgia Tech, for the last five games, have been over one point per possession. But prior to that, one, two, three, four, five, six straight opponents going back to Oklahoma, the Tar Heels held under one point per possession. So that's the goal, Emily. Keep all these teams down under that. And then the goal for Carolina is keep doing what they've been doing offensively. I There have been these two games under one, but man, stay above one the rest of the season. Definitely, yeah. Stay above, stay above that one and... Um, all that is is just, you know, continuing to do, like you said, what we've been doing. Let's move on to uh, point number two here, rebounding. Uh, man, this is going to be – this is going to be big time. And, you know, rebounding was was at one point a question for us, and now it's become a staple. Yeah. Uh, we, currently, we currently lead the ACC in rebounds per game at 41.6, um, 29.1 defensive rebounds per game. 12 and a half offensive rebounds per game. That's really important because Duke is eighth in the ACC, 26.3 defensive rebounds per game, 9.6 offensive rebounds per game. So there's obviously a clear advantage Carolina when it comes to rebounding numbers, uh, and we need to make sure that we absolutely maintain that going into this game. Yeah, I mean, Pac, we we can't talk. You just said it a minute ago. Like, it is so critical um, to not only lead the rebounding battle, but continue to finish those defensive possessions with um, with g- grabbing those rebounds and making that happen. Like it's just so importantly critical um, to to be able to do that. Um, as you said, Carolina leads at forty one point six. Duke, uh, you add those two numbers together, thirty five point nine. So Carolina, as a team on the season, is about plus six, plus seven. I don't have my rebounding stats pulled up but that's about equal to what they are above Duke on the season average. So we're going to be watching for that in a very big way in this one. Number three, Pack. we've talked a lot about the turnovers. Um, now the issues have been in the first half and they have been on the road. However, it's because of the last two games being on the road, it's been the last two games where Carolina has had 12 and then 10 turnovers in the first half of the last two games. Pack, something's got to change there. Now, Coach Rob on yesterday's show called it a yellow light because it's not quite yet enough of a sample size and it's not been happening at home. But this is going to be an important game where the the, the team just has to be all in with that. No sloppy, no get, like, it's almost like they get up by 8, 9, 10, 11 and then just downshift into second a little bit or something like that. Man, you got to stay in fourth, fifth, and go, and then be able to shift speeds when you need to. But man, no unforced errors. I'm I'm okay with you. You know, you're gonna have a turnover here and there as you're playing um, really good high intensity basketball. That's gonna happen. But I'm I'm looking for five or fewer in the first half. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and for the total of the game, we need to keep it in single digits or right. uh, you know ten at most. And so. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, it seems in the second half we've been doing a very good job of taking care of the ball. Um, so we just need to start that from the tip. We'll be good to go. <laughs> hey, guys, we're actually going to start this game with the second half, and so that's great news. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, let's get into our fourth and final uh, four corner foul concerns. You know, mm-hmm. the last three games, Kyle Filipowski has um, had four fouls, five fouls and four fouls. So Hmm. part of, you know, as we all know this, but as a part of HD's game plans, what's he always trying to do? Get to the free throw line because that's where we're efficient. And so um, I'm sure that the the Georgia tech game. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I'm sure that's where we're going to be targeting is can we get flip and foul trouble? Can, can we make them go to their bench and can we find ways to get to the free throw line on the flip side of that? Flip. Yeah. 
Uh, no pun intended there. Uh, can we can we get EC out of foul trouble? Can we keep Cadeau out? You know, because it seems like at this point it just finds its way to him. I mean, it's just it's like it's like how do we avoid this? But um, can we keep Elliot out of foul trouble? And can we keep Armando out of foul trouble? Yeah, I think is another uh, concern there. You know, guarding guarding Filipowski is going to be a, a challenge in itself. So we need to m- maintain our guys on the court, keep them out of foul trouble but also uh, press the ball down the floor, uh, make them get to their bench and keep them into foul trouble. Pat, quickly, Ken Palm, you said, has it Carolina by six. Give me a prediction. 83-77 Tar Heels. Ooh, I like it. Uh, I, I got to stay with what I said as I was recording with J.J. Jackson. Close one, Carolina wins but doesn't cover. Give me 72-70. to 70. Ooh. Ooh. That's a little too much for my heart, but we'll see what happens. Um, Okay, Pac, let me remind everyone, not only do we have this show, we've got a crossover with J.J. Jackson, the host of Locked On Blue Devils. We've got a show coming out tomorrow, Saturday, with Brendan Marks from The Athletic, who covers for a long time both these teams and now college basketball at the national level. And then Saturday after the game, we will have a live postcast win or lose. So we will either have a therapy session or baby, please, please, please let us be having a celebration party on Saturday night. That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Big thanks as always to Coach Pat Kilby for joining and all his great insights and wisdom don't forget to join the discord man you're gonna want to make sure you're in there for this game tomorrow again the link is in the show notes it's free come be part of it subscribe to the show on audio and video format smash the like button if you're watching so we know you are here if you would leave a rating and a review five stars talk about why you love locked on tar heels it helps so much friends it's always a great day to be a tar heel we'll talk again tomorrow after the game but until then peace